I'll call the meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is an open meeting of the Sioux Nebraska Governing Body. The city is certified by the Nebraska Open Meetings Act in conducting business. A copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act is displayed on the north wall of this meeting room facility as required. Disclosure of meeting recording processes is posted in the meeting room. A participant sign sheet is available for use by any citizen addressing the council. Presenters shall approach the podium, state their name and address for the clerk's record, and are asked to limit remarks to five minutes. All remarks shall be directed to the mayor, who shall determine by whom any appropriate response shall be made. The city of Sioux reserves the right to adjust the order of items on this agenda if necessary, and may elect to take action on any of the items listed. Please call the roll. Taylor. Here. Coulterman. Present. Streisen. Here. Tanyas. Here. Singleton. Here. Morgan. Here. Miller. Here. Wilkin. Here. All right, first three items make up this evening's consent agenda. Move to approve. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor, Wilkin, Kaler, Tanyas, Coulterman, Miller, Singleton, Streisand, Morgan, 8-0. All right, uh, first administrative item is the update on the wellness center, Greg. Yes, um, so pursuant to our actions at the last city council meeting, uh, I engaged with VVH Architecture to begin the contract negotiations. We received those contracts. I sent them on to Shane with the Sewer Wellness Center uh, Committee. Kelly received those as well, correct Kelly? And then myself, and then also Dave come with Concordia just because of his experience working with um, contracts on buildings and things like this to get his feedback. Um, Kelly and I went back and forth, but we didn't have a time to button up the finals on those. Uh, the other one was we also received information from me and Shane have been working with Ashley Drake, which is our manager for the Shovel Ready grant, and she approved last Friday, was that correct, Shane? Mm -hmm. That we can move forward with the CMR uh, process if that is the direction we wish to go, because Davis Bacon does not apply to our grant for Shovel Ready, thus the Wellness Center project at all. And she put that in writing, and I did forward <coughs> that on to Cleve, to Shane, um, and the reason being is under their new interpretation of, of that program, if we do not have shovel or Davis-Bacon requirements from any other federal grant dollars coming into that project, then Davis-Bacon doesn't apply at all. And that's how they determine their final determination. Is that accurate? Yep. And so from that, we knew that that was what Cleve with BBH was concerned about. He knew when he had worked on previous Davis-Bacon related projects involving federal grant dollars that Sometimes they're like, we want hard bids, we want this, this, and this. And so he wanted that in writing from DED, so he got that from Ashley. So I did forward that on to Cleve uh, with BVH as well. So that kind of steered us in the direction of discussing, like I briefed you last time, uh, and we have the ordinance in front of us, uh, moving to try and go with the CMR approach for this project. So that's probably the biggest things that we undertook in regards to it. I also reached out, I know Matt sits on the committee and, and Shane does as well. I reached out to uh, Holdridge and Beatrice YMCAs. They both have worked with BBH in the past and are currently on their remodels, or at least the remodel of the Beatrice Family YMCA. And I reached out to their executive directors to kind of get, just get some additional feedback in regards to their facilities and working with BBH. And so I'm just waiting for that information and. We'll probably have some sort of Zoom meeting with them as well to kind of get some feedback. And so that's the other thing that's kind of in the hopper right now. My hope is to tie up the contracts, have Kelly approve the direction we're going, uh, and get those all finalized, and then for approval at your next meeting. So, Any questions for Greg? In the meantime, the Wellness Committee will meet again next week, and we'll be going over some of the specifics of the building, just trying to give some things that we've picked up over the last nine months since the initial draft design and schematic, and just start putting those things in BVH's hands to move that forward and have them get started on, on the process of thinking through that. So that's the update. We do have the ordinance time. We'll take that up specifically. Um, so, but any other questions on the Wellness Center? If not, we will move on. Next 
item. We have the Highway 2 Award Community Development Block Grant CDBG Downtown Revitalization Program. This is a forgivable loan. Do you want to just give a little bit of history on this program real quick? Yep. So people know where we're so at. So the Downtown Revitalization Grant, this is our stage, we call it Phase 3. Uh, the reason it's Phase 3 is because our first grant, for those council members that weren't involved in it, was initially a downtown planning grant. From that, you go into phase two, which is the application and projects. We did um, downtown um, revitalization grants that focused on commercial rehabilitation, facade work. Uh, and so we did that first round of it. We completed a number of projects uh, in downtown. And then we also utilized a bit of LB840 money to supplement the projects that we didn't complete with DTR back in phase two. We opened up phase three this spring, took applications for that, and then those applications have been moving through the process. A few of them are underway or complete. Some of them got tied up, as you may have heard, in regards to some uh, issues with SHPO, which is the State Historic Preservation Office. We had, on the previous round, no issues with kind of, we'll say modern, but the more dark metal framed buildings or storefronts and windows. And then this round, SHPO decided that they didn't want to do that. They weren't going to approve those. We said we approved them on our last round, what was different. And so ultimately, the LB840 DTR committee had to approve a specific downtown window guideline. And those guidelines then opened it up so that we could have basically those matching. Because the part part is we're going to get into a point now where we're not matching what people are doing. And we just want a cohesive look. And it seems that the look that is most desirable right now is kind of that either bronze metal or that you see maybe in the Rivoli or something like that, or the, the black is the tended to be the preferred. Um, the white doesn't stand out well. And then the recommendation a majority of them were making was strictly, uh, I believe, the aluminum framed ones. And then the recommendation was you can paint them, which is not practical in any way, shape, or form to paint aluminum windows after they're installed. So we pass those guidelines, start moving more projects forward. Um, a project is first approved by the DTR LB840 committee. It's the same committee. And then it goes back to SEND, which is Southeast Nebraska Development District, and Kelly Gentrup. Kelly Gentrup is our CDBG certified administrator on this project. She works to undertake what's called a tier two review. It's a tier two environmental review. That's when you contact SHPO, that's when you go back and look at historical records in regards to there wasn't a underground gas tank or something on the location or, or anything else that would relate. A lot of the times we've cleared most of these through background and, and items before. So once the tier two is complete, then we bring it to the council. And so the two you have tonight, these are applications received in the spring and they just released the tier two approval uh, that was finished by Kelly. And so this is, um, I believe Cosmic Cow, and then uh, what we previously referred to as the Mariquin building. And so uh, these two arms on here, we noted that the Mariquin building, as I listed it on the agenda, as being also listed with IH Fury LLC. In the middle of this process, this project, or this uh, site was purchased, up for sale and sold um, to IH Fury LLC, which also owns other properties along the square. And so the recommendation from Kelly was, you've got two approaches. You can either transfer the project and keep it going under the, as it was applied for, complete it, because it was reviewed by the LB840 committee. I included the minutes in an email I sent you earlier today. There's unanimous approval to approve the, the east window wall windows, uh, cover them up to 75% of the cost of replacement for those up to the amount applied for by the grant. And so that was all approved by LB40. Tier two was opened up, and we bring it for you tonight. And there's a question about whether we could do that. I think Kelly Gentrop at SEND, our administrator, has given us a path forward. We just need to get the documentation wrapped up. And as long as we can do that, you can move it forward with the current owner. Um, and I know that Mr. Del Camp's here tonight if you do have any questions. Otherwise, I think the other option is, is that you deny it. And then if we do have funds left at the end, you open it back up, like Kelly said, and then they can get back in line. But um, she was comfortable with transferring it. We can have all the documentation wrapped up. It'll be signed off by the LLC. Uh, and it gets three windows replaced, which is kind of our purpose. But I can answer any questions. It was kind of a 
sketch of a day trying to chase down all the emails that were flying around on this. But. The DTR has been actually a really good program for us because it allows businesses that want to participate and want to make the investment, gives them an opportunity to leverage those dollars. And I think the community as a whole, you know, benefits from a downtown that's vibrant. And um, if you've noticed over maybe the past five years, the, the downtown buildings, the facades, you've seen tremendous improvement from paint and windows. And it's just nice to see that uh, reinvestment in the community. And so, um, and, and, and just kind of wanting, the, especially the, the new council members, just to kind of understand this because we'll keep doing these phases as long as there's business owners willing to make that investment. Uh, I don't believe there's a limit on how many times you can apply. It's just eventually you might run out of people and resources to be able to take advantage of the program. But, but that's it. Um, Rich, did you have a question? Yeah, it was, I want to go back to something Kelly was talking about earlier. And, and um, I mean, you mentioned Kelly in there. And also, Greg, um, it appears that a lot of people are using this money for their frontage, their entrance doors, windows, and so forth. Are there any guidelines other than the, the dark metal aluminum casings for the windows that can go in? Is it just whatever they design they can apply for? No, and the guidelines are, I mean, Carl's our only LB40 committee member that's mm -hmm. sitting here that sat on it at the time we approved the guidelines. What they want to see, and this is a SHPO guideline, so State Historic Preservation General Guidelines, they want to see accurate framing. And so if you have a double hung window or a single pane, or maybe it's a, uh, we think some of the transom windows have the little cubes in them. Mm -hmm. However those were framed is what they want to see ultimately. And so however your framing is, they want to match the framing. Sometimes the edge wear is not the biggest issue, but the framing, the way it hangs in regards to how it looked historically, that's one of them. The guidelines are pretty detailed, um, but they always, if you can, if you have old wood, wood windows, they would like to see them preserved if you can, but Mr. Delcamp can speak to you better than I can because he's got quite a few of these. A lot of these, the windows have not been taken care of or just over time have weathered right. so poorly that they are not functional anymore. You can't reframe them enough at, at cost. The cost is so exorbitant to have somebody come in that works within that profession and refurbish those in a way that makes them conducive, let alone they also don't have any of the, we'll say winterizing properties, well, probably not even winterizing, it's probably both summer and yeah. winter, those extreme temperatures, but they're weathering. And so the preference for most of them, because they're trying to be economical, they're trying to have buildings that don't use so much heat, so much energy, to have more modernized building materials. And so the preference tends to be almost every single building owner is trying to build these. Because again, you don't want to be in somewhere that's extremely hot and now it's a commercial space or a livable space or anything else within our downtown. Mm -hmm. So they're constantly trying to work through that. That's usually, and I've always forewarned them, the number one thing you'll fight with SHPO on on these projects is windows. We're not getting fights about roofs. We're not getting fights with SHPO about, you know, usually doorways and things. But it is windows, framing, how they're hung, what they look like, you know, during the historic designated period. Um, and we have an exorbitant, our, we have a very extensive era because our, you can go back up to 50 years and it counts as historic. Well, ours begins way before that because of the age of some of these buildings. The other one is, is some of the buildings um, are qualified in the context that they're actually historic and part of the historic district, and some of them are counted as non-qualifying. So what that means is basically either the big building didn't exist during the historic period, or it was built afterwards, or it collapsed and they built something else. Many, many reasons, but then those buildings, they don't have to follow any of the requirements because they're not historic buildings yet, and they don't contribute to our district. We don't have, we may have a few buildings that are singularly historic mm -hmm. or maybe designated, but for the most part in downtown, it's the historic district that they're looking at. And that all of that information is defined in our um, downtown revitalization plan. So the district, what qualifies, um, and so I think we have that available online, but if you're ever interested in it, we can send it out to you. Mm -hmm. Can so, we approve those with one motion, or we got to do them separately? I would do them separately okay. because we should do, if we're going to approve the one with the transfer, we should do it contingent, and I'll read the language from um, Kelly Gentro. 
We just so. want to make sure we have a discussion on the mm -hmm. program so everyone understands kind of where we're at, and then we can take each one up separately. Rich? Yeah, and this this extends beyond the square, correct? It does, absolutely, yes. So so businesses that are off the square also have that same opportunity. The, it, it was a, funny enough, we didn't give it any other specific boundary that we had. A lot of the downtown, our, what we call our light and substandard area is massive. It's way mm -hmm. bigger than downtown. But, so we couldn't use that because it encompasses downtown and everything else. We looked at the central business district as a zoning district, what we call the CBD. Well, the problem is the CBD stretches and goes into areas that you may not traditionally by eyesight go, oh yeah, that's a downtown building, like the new buildings along the old middle school. But I think those are zoned central business district, correct? And so we didn't feel that that was appropriate, especially because it's all new redevelopment. Why would we want to extend the downtown revitalization district? And so we just kind of had to draw a line and overlap as much that we felt. And then the other one is the actual designated historic district, as was sent into the um, National Register of Historic Places. And so it's all of these different parameters, and we kind of line them all up and set a district. I know if you talk to Pat Colmeyer, she's really mad that we missed her by like at Liberty House. And she says, next time we do that, Please change that. So we'll definitely consider. Um, and one of our plans is after this round is our hope is we're going to go back and review that and make an update to that. Because I know there was a lot of discussion about downtown alleys and making them functional spaces in different ways. Well, the way to leverage dollars to do that is to have it in our plan. So we need to revisit the plan a little bit. Any other questions or comments regarding the program? Yeah, quick question. So you said we're in phase three of this. Was there a difference between phase two and phase three? Like as no. far as any, okay, so no. this is just another, uh, just another round. Yep. Okay, and how many phases are there? As many as they'll give you grants for. Oh, okay. okay. Yep, as you have money. And we've Annually? also just, no, it's through a grant cycle. Oh, okay. and so. so how long Jonathan, do you clarify yeah, that? I was just gonna make a quick clarification. So the only difference really substantively between phase two and three was the matching. Phase two was 50% match. This one, it was a little more lucrative to the favor of the building and business owners, 75% match, because we want to get the money out faster. Okay. The other one that happened, and Carl can speak to this to LBA 40, was that during this round, DED became far more restrictive on code compliance, because we renovated a number of downtown buildings, interiors, up to code compliance. Basically, code compliance meant you go, you have it inspected. If it's not up to code, to bring it to code, we would cover those costs. And they covered that in numerous buildings on phase two. On phase three, new DE direction, they said code compliance is only ADA, fire suppression, life safety. And so we had numerous people that were coming in with, you know, hey, mine doesn't have any electrical. I need to bring it up to code on electrical. I need to bring the plumbing up to code. I need to bring it up to code as a commercial space. And we had applications come in, and then DED was like, we're not approving any of these. And we said, it's literally in the guidelines we have sent you guys. And we, they sent back and said, no, here's our definition of code compliance now. And so it's become an issue on some other grants. And so what we tried to do is take those to LB840, because like we said in phase two, we took some that we thought were going to be issues, take them to LB840 and see if we could supplement some of those just like we did with La Casina and Bottle Rocket and some of those other projects that we did on phase two. So some of them were approved, some of them were not. And that's the reason why the DTR committee is the same as LB840 was so that the same people as they're considering, you know, the DTR grants also could keep an eye on the LB840 dollars so they could, we want it to be more of a seamless, um, you know, collaboration, I guess, uh, between the two different programs by having the same people involved. So maybe that was that was the in intent for why we did it that way. One of the other discussions that we'll have as a community and as a council when we move into the next round when we do this, we'll do the planning. And technically, we don't have to wait for a grant to do the planning. We could initiate the plan ourselves and pay for it. Just It's not going to be super expensive. Um, but we could initiate that process, get the plan updated, is we could do a public project with the DTR funds. One of the things we've talked about as a potential project would be looking at, like, for some safety and pedestrian issues, 
the bump outs that are recommended in the downtown plan to try and eliminate some of these elongated crosswalks and some of the you know site issues that are going on that's one of the things that doesn't mean mean we would but that's an example of one we could do to help to alleviate some of those issues especially around the courthouse square those two corners on seward street on the north side of the courthouse square are not they're not aligned correctly at all if you look at an overhead so and it causes sightline issues pedestrian issues it just makes it more dangerous because the pedestrian is walking that much further that's an example of something we could do with these grant dollars as well we could do a public downtown project, but that's at a later date. Our priority is just giving the business owners and property owners the opportunity to maximize this resource while it's here, and and we can always you know expand, like Greg said, if we if we're able to in the future. But um, but yeah, they're hundred year old buildings. We wanted to make sure that they had the resources available to maintain them because I mean they a lot of them are a lot of them share walls and they're connected and really don't want anything bad to happen to one because you know it can impact you know other buildings as well so that's why i was telling matt council years ago we went and toured them it was it was interesting sites well yeah the dirt basements is always fun yeah it was i won't go elaborate <laughs> but, uh, it was interesting i've been in the basement at cafe on the square too many times so <laughs> that's those are old buildings mm -hmm. so i think they're more than 100. well i rounded it down <laughs> um, so before you, yeah, I guess the next thing would be to take them up. In the yeah. Does anybody have any general yeah. questions? Yeah, I want to make sure you had an opportunity to ask about the program in general. But if you're good with the programs in general, we can go to, uh, we go with A first. Yeah, I'll make a motion too. But we need to clarify on the mayor point yep. first. And so, so that, um, this is the mayor point. Is that, would you, so the preference would be is to allow this one for a transfer to the current yes, owner. Yes, that would be my okay. preference. Um, so a motion to approve contingent that the new owner of the property IH Fury LLC provide to the DTR committee and the council a copy of the transfer of the deed and a request to modify the application letter uh, that Kelly will draft indicating the transfer of ownership and certifying the amount of CDG grant funds and scope of work has not changed. Is that your motion? Yes. That second. Is my motion. You have a second. Is there any further discussion on item A? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor of Wilkin, Kayla, Tanya, Coulterman, Miller, Singleton, Streisenberg, and Eve Zero. Just, just to clarify, yes, Greg, you mean Kelly Hofschneider, not Kelly Gentro? No, it's it's Kelly Gentro. Okay. She's the it's the grant manager. Okay, She's I the just want to get our Kelly straight. Yeah. Yep. All right. I, yeah. For the record. Sorry. Yeah. For, for, the, for, the, for the record. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. I apologize. They're no, not. No problem. They're not spelled differently either. So. No. I apologize. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Item 2B, Taj Macau, uh, Roxanne O'Hare, 636 Seward Street. Any discussion on this one? Or we entertain a motion? I'll make a motion to approve that one as well. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor, Wilkin, Kaler, Tanya, Coulterman, Miller, Singleton, Streisen, Morgan, and Eve Zero. Okay. Item three, consideration of ordinance to adopt the political subdivision construction alternative act. Great. Yes, a copy of the ordinance is here. This is an item I kind of briefed you on before. Um, and Kelly can kind of help guide me on this one. So this is a basically a strict, complete adoption of the revised statutes uh, as they exist almost. Uh, it's a very specific process laid out in state statute that we're given authority to undertake by choice of the council. We don't have to do this in any case. But by choice of the council, we're allowed for two alternative project delivery methods. Uh, those are defined on, on the front page of the ordinance here. The first one is the construction manager at risk contract. Uh, this is the one where we bring in the, the contractor that will build the project along with the design team, and they work... The contractor essentially works hand in hand with us as the owner and they communicate back and forth on our behalf to work through some of the issues that would come up during the design phase, both to eliminate issues down the line while you're actually building the building and also to bring the price of the project down to a point where they will offer at one point a guaranteed number to build your project for you before you once you've gotten to a sufficient design level. Uh, this was utilized by the uh, middle for the middle school construction. 
Uh, and then Concordia on their most two recent projects, the Science Building and the Music Building, have both used this process. Um, it was recommended also to take a look at this by uh, the Sewer Wellness Committee. And in our interviews with uh, the different finalists for the design firms, they were comfortable using it. The firm we had, this was their preference. Not that that swayed us one way or the other. We had already come to the determination by the committee that we would probably prefer this. Because it gives us an opportunity, and I, the example I always use is you look at a, a light fixture, and they design a really nice, high-level LED, beautiful-looking light fixture that when they spec it out into the specs that are given in the bid documents, that ultimately ends up being a $500 light fixture. Say you have 50 or 70 of those throughout your building, your construction partner, your contractor, will work with you and go, I can get you from my subs that exact same look, same wattage, same color, same design, generally, maybe a slight adjustment for a quarter of the cost based on market quotes right now. You should move to that and not this. Because again, it's not, not anything nefarious, but also the project, some of the payment is designed on what the final project is. And so the contractor is working to try and alleviate some of those issues and bring those value uh, driven costs down. And so it's just a different method. We still go through a very intricate process to select a contractor based on a letter of interest that goes out and this walks through it. And then uh, we'll do finalists, we'll do interview process just like the, what we did for the design firm. And then we'll ultimately select one uh, that will work hand in hand. Again, they're uh, it's just bringing them in far earlier because they're working as your uh, benefactor rather than the traditional design bid build where they they find their own subs they get their own quotes they put together a bid you get what's there and you don't have any discussion or control over any of those elements this they'll be working hand in hand with you uh, to try and basically engineer down the cost further where again I'm not gonna know Maybe who we're having manage this building is not going to know. Bob Core or Larry with the electric department may not know that, yeah, you can get that fixture when looking through the specs for a quarter of the price. Or, you know, the way that we're framing out the drywall in the office section. Some of those things are just, you need a contractor that knows it on the day to day. Um, and we have a litany of them that are building buildings in town and that we've seen around so that we can get the letter of interest out to. We've already been contacted by a number of them since we basically green-lighted the Wellness Center back last summer. So uh, they're interested and, and would love to be partners with us if that's the route we go. We are, again, we're not required. It's always by choice by the council and any project. We also can't use that process in what we would traditionally think of as public work projects. We're not gonna build a street this way. We're not gonna build the water tower this way. We're not gonna build a sanitary sewer line or a storm sewer. We're not gonna do that. But it works very well for buildings and other things where you just don't have the technical expertise day to day sitting around with you in house. The other option, and it's also noted in here, is the design build process. This means you would select one firm, and I can give an example because you might be familiar with it. It's like an heirs and heirs. You'd select one firm, go through that process of interviews and RFQs and everything, select one, and they would do the whole process with you themselves. They have all, they'll, they'll gather up the contractors and everything else, so it'll all be brought to you in one package. Um, this was a recommendation a number of years ago when we were working back on the Civic Center renovations that they were saying, the approach to this might be a design build approach. That might be your best to get an architect in here who can get you to the finish line all the way through the process, or at least a firm that can handle that sort of volume. Um, and so it gives you another option, and you know, traditionally we haven't utilized these, but also the city of Seward traditionally isn't building a ton of buildings. You know, we're not building one every five years or 10 years or a new school or adding them on. Um, and so these things have changed. These are all authorized just within the last 10 to 15 years by the legislature. And so a lot of cities have not caught up. We reached out and I worked with the city of Columbus and the city of Kearney to draft the ordinance and send it on to Kelly. It reads verbatim to state statute. Basically state statute doesn't really give you any authority to change what they let us do. The way it works is even down to these odd 
and I can answer any questions, but you see it, in, for instance, where it goes through and it says the selection committee shall evaluate. This would be on page one, two, three, four, five. This is the evaluation criteria for when we evaluate the contractor. And it has each of these criterion and the maximum you will allow. Below list is the maximum percentage of total points for evaluation. Again, they don't add up to 100, which is funny. But they said, if you, when you use these, the maximum you'll weigh one of these. And then we have to decipher what that weight will be once we get into the process. But it is to that level of depth that the state, they basically gave you no wiggle room. A lot you, of want, shells. you want to do this, do what we give you, and that's it. Or don't do it. And so that's what we gleaned from Kearney and Columbus. Um, and so that really is the process. Um, More shells than May. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, you shall do this, this, this. There's not. So is that... Did I miss anything on that, Kelly? No, I mean, the devil's in the details with the contract for either, either one of his methods. Yep. But this just gives you two, two different tools to use. You have questions or comments on this item? I, would get, I, I just would like to make a comment. I think that we have a, a fairly informed group uh, kind of helping the city behind this. Um, experienced and uh, there was a very in-depth discussion about you know construction manager at risk versus design build and, the, and the, the pros and cons of both both methods and stuff and this is this is a really good I personally I think this is a really good um, option to have a good tool to have for the city and for future councils too so um, but saying that too I think it's going to be a lot more work personally for everybody on the committee and everybody involved with those committees because we'll get it's going to be more hands-on whereas the the process before might have been okay here's our specs here's what we want it to look like it's all yours let us know when it's finished so I think there's going to be a lot more communication in the process and, and like Greg I'd like to really emphasize what Greg said that the construction people will be um, involved a lot earlier in the project which <clears throat> I think all of us kind of like what we heard there as far as the chance for success and the chance to, you know, get maximum maximum benefit for our, for our dollar spent. So just, just want to reiterate that, that, um, you know, after we got through with these meetings with the three, the three um, architectural for design firms that we discussed, you know, and, and hit with BVH to try to direct Greg to do that contract, you know, basically they've come, made the comment, well, We'll be back here in a couple of weeks, and we're going to do this all over again with construction managers, and that's what we're shooting for. That's kind of, I just wanted to relay that, communicate that and, um, <coughs> to the rest of the council. Well, and I really do appreciate everyone's commitment, because I do think that this is the biggest project we've done in this community from a, from a community benefit standpoint, and, and uh, you know, I always, pre I always prefer the public-private partnerships working together, because... We don't have the expertise, you know, to, to just one person doesn't have the expertise <coughs> and something of this, you know, magnitude, it's kind of like the measure twice, cut once, you know, philosophy of I want to make sure that we spend more time on the front end of this and try to avoid, you know, issues on, on the back end um, because we did our due diligence and the group that was invested in this whole project all along is there making sure, seeing it from many different angles so that we don't hopefully miss anything. Um, so I do appreciate everyone's time on this committee and the work that they put forward and, and throughout this entire process. Um, any other questions or comments on this? Yes. I just kind Carl. of want to add on, you know, with Matt's and in those meetings is just the fact that <clears throat> one of the things that was stated is that we are dealing with funding and public funding on this building. So anywhere we can save money, um, especially with the engineering firms working with design up front, cutting out that window of we designed it here's the engineer this isn't going to work we go back um, is one of the efficiencies that they highlighted on that construction management at risk um, the other one th that uh, was discussed was supply change issues supply chain issues are still a problem that are ongoing so going with the CMR the construction management at risk kind of is built and designed and more used frequently in the last couple of years to alleviate those problems to where you're not tied to somebody may get a bid that's lower and that looks great but they can't get it for two years where somebody else might be able to get it to you in six months 
and it alleviates your hands being tight with the one bit to the other one. And so I think that, especially in the current environment and our timetable on the Wellness Center and the funding, definitely gives us a great opportunity and avenue to continue moving forward with this. The other thing it allows us to do, it allows us also to bid the project out kind of in pods. So we're able to bid out some of the utility work and the grading and the landscape, not landscaping, but that initial site prep work. And we can get that whole package out, finished by the civil engineers, bid it out, get it out the door because the contractor's like, I'm good with it. Let's go, let's get the subs on it and get them going. And then you can move into the other phases of the building. You usually see about three that they can manage that. That gets you out the door faster than waiting for the whole package to be able to be approved and out the door and pushing it further back. And so that's also another benefit is the timeline with the CMR. The last thing is just to note, and me and the mayor talked about this today, we actually can approve this. He was okay with it in regards to the fact we had it all good to go on listed on the agenda. It was on the agenda. It's just if, if you're looking for it in the packet, there was a bit of a delay in getting that to you. So if you have any reservations, we can always hold off on this tonight. But if you're comfortable with the time that you had to review it, we could you can take action on it. Because it was on the agenda, so there's not a public notice issue there. And it's made it'll be made available to the public. So if anyone the public wishes to review it who hasn't, they can we always contact it. City Hall. We have that available. It's well, just in the interest of keeping the project moving forward as fast as possible, I'd like to approve this tonight. Any other questions or comments? Or would someone like to introduce the uh, ordinance? I'd, I'd like to introduce ordinance 2023-1. All right. Great. The ordinance has, one moment here, I haven't done this in a while. An ordinance to amend and add to the municipal code of the city of Seward chapter 100, purchasing and contracts, article two, to provide for construction alternative methods in accordance with the political subdivision construction alternatives act in the city of Seward to be repeal all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict to provide for an effective date to provide for publication of this ordinance in pamphlet form. The ordinance has been read by title and designated as ordinance number 2023-1 and the title is hereby approved. I need a motion to dispense with the statutory rule. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Just want to note for, because we have a new council, this is their first time oh, suspending yeah. the statutory rule. Anytime we pass an ordinance, an ordinance by statutory requirement by the state of Nebraska has to be read three times. Most, and I, we did this in orientation, but remind everybody, most of those can be waived by a three-fourths majority vote of the council. So that'd be six out of eight. And so that can be done here. Certain ordinances like an annexation have to be read all three times. There is no, and so there's a few other nuances. Usually annexation is the big one though, correct Kelly? Correct. That no matter what, we're reading it three times and that's just how you get through it. So, so unless there's a reason to um, draw it out over multiple meetings, we typically would recommend uh, waiving the statute requirement, just so that, especially when it deals with economic development, just to keep things moving forward. Um, but it's not, you know, it's up to the council if you want to. There are times when we've had controversial issues where we decide, okay, we maybe need to have another meeting or two just to give the public an opportunity, or we didn't have enough present council members in order to waive it. And so we'd had a discussion, did the first reading, and then we just went on to the next meeting for the second reading. In that case, you know, in the second meeting, if we have enough council members and the desire is to waive it, you can waive it and not do the third reading. So it just, it's up to the, uh, it's the council's prerogative on how they want to proceed. But that's, that will be this first vote. It's not on, on the merits of this ordinance. This is simply on whether you want to waive the statutory three reading requirement. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Saying none, please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor, Wilkin, Kayla, Thomas, Fulterman, Miller, Sullivan, Streisand, Morgan, 8-0. Again, this is ordinance number 2023-1. Would anyone like to move that this ordinance be passed and adopted as read? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question is, shall ordinance number 2023-1 be finally passed and adopted? Please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor, Wilkin, Kaylor, Thomas, Fulton, Miller, Simpson, Streisand, Morgan, 8-0.
And when we have ordinances on the agenda that do get passed, we do have to have one final vote to make them a part of the permanent record. Um, so if we had, let's say, three or four or five ordinances, we would go through each of those. And then, at, then when we're at the last ordinance, then I would say um, that we need uh, one final motion to make the ordinances a part of the permanent record. And then it asks for a motion. I'll move to make them part of the permanent record. And a second. Second. The motion and a second. Please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor, Wilkin, Kaler, Tanya, Coltsman, Miller, Singleton, Strikes, and Morgan, 8 0. Okay, thank you. I just got bifocal, so that's I'm really struggling tonight <laughs> doing all this reading. <laughs> City Administrator's Report. Um, probably the biggest ones is we continue to work through. We, you know, knock on wood, we thought we had two police officer positions filled and then we lost one right at the end. And so we continue that process. And so, again, remembering this dates back to, I believe, February now having an opening within the police department that's still unfilled. Uh, but we did fill the second one, and hopefully we'll have a new officer on board uh, on staff on the 9th. Uh, the other one is the wastewater water director for a replacement for, the, uh, for Tim Richtig, who passed away. And so we did start the process of review, um, and so we do have a few other leads. I want to commend Derek for his work leading up to him getting out of here for the holidays. Uh, we did send letters uh, just noting the project or the availability of the opening. Due to the nature of the certifications you ultimately have to have for that position, there are very few people in the state of Nebraska that are qualified to do that, at least up front, without any additional background work and testing to be done. And so uh, Derek did a great job cross-referencing those lists at the state because they're publicly available and sending out some targeted letters, just letting people know the availability, not saying that we would take you or wouldn't, but just saying, hey, we have this opening uh, due to some unfortunate circumstances. If you're interested, let us know. So we'll get, try to get through that process, see what we can get, if we can get a, a team of people uh, together to do some interviews and take a look at candidates. But uh, for now, that still remains open. Uh, and Gary, uh, down in the water waste water plant, is doing an incredible job keeping things afloat. So. My kudos to him as well. The last thing I'll just note, as you may have seen and happening in today, um, how quickly and important it is to have really good communication right now. Uh, we had the item from the Solid Waste Agency come out that basically hurried up to have many conversations with the mayor, frantic emails to you, and you read the email because I forwarded it to you, that kind of made it sound like this is really urgent, we need your feedback, and then we're running around on something trying to figure out, you know, what is somebody potentially going to bring to the landfill? And then in the background, we're trying to do our due diligence, prepare, see what we can do. You know, Council Member Singleton is doing a great job providing feedback and saying we need to kind of talk with the public. All this is going on in the middle of the morning. I'm getting, you know, text messages and calls from the administrator in Crete asking questions about this. I'm like, I need to call Milford and talk to their mayor. Like, what is going on with this? And then ultimately, um, the Solid Waste Agency gets a hold of us at noon after I've wasted a whole morning chasing everyone around and trying to keep everybody informed. And then they're like, oh yeah, we're not taking it. Don't worry about it. So that, that, that seems to keep happening on things. And it's eating up a lot of our time or department heads' times. And so the point is, it's really about good communication. And so we're going to press that upon our department heads, ourselves internally, myself, to do a better job communicating with the mayor, with you guys. That you know, goal for 2023 is really about communication. We had it as our we meet as a city hall group this morning. It's finance and billing and administration all together. We have our own little meeting in there, and I reminded my staff, hey. This issue you're having, it's about communication. The reason we're not getting this right is because we're not communicating. And so it's just kind of a prime example of that. And so we're really going to try to strive to do an even better job of communicating to you guys, to the public, through social media, everything we do. Just try to take it a step further. Because we can see what happens when it's done poorly. We waste a lot of time and a lot of effort for something that turned out to be nothing. And it's just, it's unfair to everybody involved, even you guys, because that's time we didn't need to take. And we keep the staff pretty busy just with normal city operations. So when something comes out of the blue that suddenly is a sense of urgency, it does cause other things to come 
to a screeching halt because you, you, you're forced to prioritize this ahead of everything else. And so, you know, as we move forward, you know, just make sure that when you bring, you know, we have, you know we're going to have like the next item here is the future requests. Just keep in mind that, you know, maybe it goes a, a, a meeting or two and you haven't seen much action on your item. It isn't because we don't want to pursue it. It's just that everything takes time and, you know, we will hope to communicate that with you better in the future so that we can help hopefully manage everyone's expectations on when things are going to happen and when things will be communicated, especially with, with, with so many new, new members of the council. Um, so that, so that, you know, we are you know, all rowing in, rowing in the same direction, so to speak. So, Greg. Unless you have any other questions about the items in there, again, I think most of our time and administration will be eaten up by big capital projects, wastewater treatment plant, wellness center, water tower, tra on the water tower. trail. Uh, we're prepping for, and I know Mike's right here, prepping for the next bid out because we didn't get any bids last time. So we're breaking that apart. We'll put it into potentially two or three bid packages because that was the concern is the person demoing the tower doesn't want to be stuck with the person that's doing the electrical. And so based on our recommendations and our engineer's recommendations, pulling those into two or three pieces, we think we'll get a better response based on the feedback we got from all the different people that took plans but never bid. So, Any questions or comments for Greg? If not, I entertain a motion to accept his report. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. You register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor. Wilkin, Kayla, Tanya, Colton, Miller, Singleton, Strice, and Morgan, 8 0. All right. Let's see a future request for council agenda items or administrative action. And again, you're welcome throughout the week, in be the weeks in between meetings. If you have issues that you want to bring, Uh, if you have uh, issues that you are made aware of that you want, want to make sure that the administration is aware of, you're always welcome to contact Greg or myself. This isn't the only time you can, you can talk to us. Um, the reason why this was put on the agenda many years ago was that there were council members that had items they wanted to be discussed either at a meeting or be handled administratively, and the concern was that it would get forgotten or you know, not get the attention it needed. By having this item in the agenda, it allows council members to bring it up now, and it would be in the minutes, and you can then go back if you, you go, hey, didn't I mention something, you know, didn't I bring something up? You could go back and, and see, yeah, it was on this meeting that was brought up, and it'll remind us if we hadn't, you know, completed whatever that item was. So this is just more of a, a way for council members to put something in the record as sort of a placeholder, like a bookmark that yeah, you might want to come back to later. So, but don't feel like if you don't bring it up right now, you can't bring it up for two more weeks. That's not the case. But uh, do you have anything for tonight's meeting? If not, did I scare you all away with that speech? Yeah, we'll just call you later. Yes, call me later. Thanks. So with that, we'll move on to uh, Jonathan, upcoming events. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, our organization, in partnership with uh, Allo Communications, has Coffee and Contacts. Uh, to welcome them to downtown Seward and their new uh, office here. Wednesday, January 18th, 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. This will include ribbon cutting at 10.30 a.m. and uh, that will be with our ambassadors and you're welcome to join us for that. Uh, again, quick reminder to mark your calendars for Monday, January 30th uh, when the Chamber will be hosting our annual awards banquet. We'll be celebrating the accomplishments of our local and business community members and please consider purchasing a ticket and joining us for this special upcoming event, and that will be on the fairgrounds. Uh, so I wanted to mention a quick things about the uh, Seward County Rural Workforce Housing Fund. Uh, we allocated uh, dollars um, down to zero of our 1.26 million this past Friday. It'll be our fourth project. Um, just to give you a couple of stats on that, um, out of the 1.26 million, we're anticipating when this fourth project is finished, we'll have created $15,753,190 worth of investment, 91 total new housing units across the county. So that's a 12 and a half times return on your investment. Um, the city of Seward invested through the LB840 fund, so we're grateful for that partnership. Um, if you didn't hear, the Nebraska legislature has allocated another 30 million into this fund for a third round of funds. 
Um, our board of directors will be considering whether we try to pursue these dollars and potentially go around to our public-private partners to pursue additional dollars. Um, as you know, we need more housing. <laughs> Not just here in Seward, but all over the county. And so I'll just kind of plant that seed here and to say, I think we're starting to see really good return on investment from the initial partnership on that. And so um, ultimately we'll be uh, talking about whether we'll pursue that here in the first quarter um, of this year. And with that, we do have a new team member, uh, Director of Marketing and Storytelling, uh, Joni Breshka, if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. Um, if you don't recognize her name, she's the president of the Seward Municipal Band. Um, she has 21 years of marketing experience. We're really fortunate to have her. She's working from home, a few blocks from the Civic Center, and super fortunate for her to join our team. Um, and so if you see her around, please welcome her um, as she joins the chamber. And with that, that's all I have. Thanks, Thanks Aaron. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, next we have a strategy session. So I move that the City Council go into closed session with the Mayor, City Administrator, City Attorney, and City Clerk for the protection of public interest, and to discuss real estate interests and provide the City Attorney with negotiating guidance for a period not to exceed 30 minutes. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please register your votes. Please display the votes. Voting in favor of Wilkin, Keeler, Tanya, Coulterman, Miller, Singleton, Stress, and Morgan, with zero. Right, the council has voted to go into closed session for the protection of the public interest and to discuss real estate and chairs to provide the city attorney with negotiating guidance. We're in closed session. Thank you.